I want to be able to read uh, a few scriptures to you today. Um, so you could start by turning to Isaiah 45. Okay, turn to Isaiah 45. And then we're going to jump over to Isaiah 54. And then we're going to jump over to Isaiah 59. So there's a method to the madness. I'm going to not keep you too long here today. I got a lot to say in a short period of time. But I, I really need to get this message uh, off my heart. And I need to get this message into you. Because I'm going to build a foundation today um, for the next, I don't know for how long, a few months possibly, dealing with uh, a Joshua Generation Church. And I'll explain why I'm naming this uh, sermon series just that. So go to Isaiah 45, 2 and 3. And the scripture I'm going to read to you today is a promise scripture given to those in Victory Outreach that first started this ministry in 1967. And the word of God says this, I will go before you and I will level the exalted places. I will break into pieces the doors of bronze and I will cut through the bars of iron. Verse 3, I will give you treasures out of darkness. Okay? Riches stored in secret places so that you may know that I'm the Lord God of Israel who have called you by name. Go over to Isaiah 54 really quick and we're going to read verse 2 and 3 there. Um, this is a second promise that was given to our ministry um, years, years later. And it says this, Enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwelling. Do not spare, lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes. And I will, and you shall expand to the right and to the left. And here's, here's, the, here's the kicker here. And your descendants will inherit the nation. Someone say inherit. Amen. Turn over to Isaiah 59. You go into the right there, verse 21. And the Bible says, As for me, this is my covenant with you, says the Lord, that my spirit will fall upon you, and my words will be put in your mouth, and my words shall not depart from your mouth, or your descendants' mouth, or your descendants' descendants' mouth, says the Lord, from this time to the ends of the earth. Father, bless your word today. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. you can go ahead and be seated. I'm starting this brand new sermon series today titled Joshua Generation. And for the last 52 years of Victory Outreach International, we have now, from 1967 to 2019, 52 years later, we have now three generations in Victory Outreach International. One of the generations that we like to call, we call them the pioneering generation. Someone say the pioneering generation. Those are the ones that started this ministry in 1967, along with Pastor Sonny and Sister Julie. And many of them occupied their own churches in the late 70s, mid 70s, late 70s, and even early 80s. And then there's another generation in Victory Outreach International, and that's called the Joshua generation. That's my generation. We're the ones that are spiritual fathers, um, are the pioneers. So because Pastor Steve and Josie Pineda came to the city of Hayward in 1981, and uh, in, uh, in, in the year 1998, when I needed help, that church was there for me. I was able to go into the men's home, and I was able to totally get my life changed forever, and not realizing that I would also become part of this great movement, and I would be part of the Joshua generation. Stay with me now, okay? And then now, someone say now. Those young people that you've seen here on stage, junior high, high school, young adults, and even college students are now being coined the third wave generation. So now we have three. We got the pioneer, we got the Joshua, and we have the third wave generation. That's, that's, some, that's some verbiage that you need to become familiar with here within Victory Outreach. I begin to think about also the United States and what kind of generations we have here within the United States. And currently, according to some studies, they say we have four different generations that are now living in the United States. One of the generations we have living in the United States is called the Builder Generation. These were men and women that were born prior to 1925. These are people that um, their significant events were World War I, the Roaring Twenties, the Great Depression. How about this one, radio? <laughs> to us, it's not a big deal, but to them, 
radio was a huge thing. Uh, Pearl Harbor, World War II, rationing, and even the Korean War were significant events for them. The characteristics of the builders, they were hard workers. Someone say hard workers. Hard workers. They were savers. They, liked, they could save money. Well, remember, they were in the Great Depression. I, my grandpa, who's gone on to be with the Lord, was in, was in World War I and II. He, if, I was, if he seen me throwing away a piece of string, he would say, what are you doing with that string? I said, Grandpa, I'm throwing it. He goes, no, no, don't throw that, that string. I'm gonna, I could use that. <laughs> and he would have a junk drawer, right? They would think they were the creators of the junk drawer. <laughs> Put that string in that junk drawer because I might be able to use it for later. Well, that's some of the characteristics that the builders have. Uh, they were frugal. They were patriotic. They were loyal. They were private. They were cautious. They were respectful, dependable, stable. And they were even intolerant. In other words, my way or the highway? There's another generation living in the United States that's known as the boomer generation. This name was coined because of all the babies that were born after World War II. When all the soldiers came back. Do the math. These were people that were born between 1954 and 1964. The baby boomers. They said that uh, during that 10 years, uh, approximately 4 million babies were born each year during that 10 years. The significant events that happened with them was the Cold War, television, <laughs> rock and roll, <laughs> assassinations, JFK, Martin Luther King. The Vietnam War was significant to them. How about this one, Watergate and Nixon resigns. Their characteristics for the baby boomers is they were educated. They were media orientated. They were cause orientated. Black Panthers, Brown Power, Green Berets, marching. There you go, thank you. They were fitness conscious, rock music fans. They were activists. They were quality conscious. And they were constantly questioning authority. Then there's another generation that came, and many scholars believe that because the boomer generation was known as a rebellious generation, that what, how are their kids going to look like? That's why they coined us. I'm one of these. They call them buster generation, but they're also known as Generation X. They couldn't even name them. They go, we don't have a name for them. So the significant events that happened with the Generation X was uh, they were born between 1965 and 1983. The significant events with them was Roe versus Wade. It's a, a, a very, uh, it, was, it was a popularized um, Supreme Court verdict that the Supreme Court voted and said that a woman could have an abortion in the first trimester of her pregnancy if, if, if it was bringing the mom into some kind of uh, uh, harm. And uh, boy, have they polluted that. But that was the big significant event that happened. They were high in technology. Video games and television were at an all-time high. Uh, peer groups became real big. In other words, because they were born in dysfunction, and they were born under divorce, and they were born with a lot of alcoholic and, and different heroin addict yeah. parents and stuff, they, 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 they went outside the home to find belonging. Yeah. So many of them would find it in gangs. They would find it in drugs. They would find it in sports. They would find it somehow, some way. They would. They would go there. Uh, they, uh, music was big, and AIDS was at an all-high epidemic. The characteristics of the Generation X was freedom. We want our freedom. They loved the 60s music. I thought that was cool. Uh, they feel neglected. They're willing to work. They're not just willing to climb the ladder to succeed. And then we have this generation that you've seen up here today and that are many of you are also a part. This is a little history lesson. I feel it was good to give it to you, so yeah, I can make an altar call. Some of you just found out what generation you're in. They call it the bridge generation, but we know it more as the millennial generation. These were children that were born from 1984 to, uh, and, and till now. And uh, their significant events uh, that happened within their life is the, it's the beginning of the postmodernism mindset. In other words, there's no absolute truth. So in other words, my truth and your truth, well, uh, you do you and I'll do me. 
So there's no absolutes. As long as it feels good, yeah. that's my truth. Yeah. And that's a whole other sermon, but I felt it was good for you. Um, significant events was technology and the internet was on an all-time high. A variety of music and also diversity is part of, their, part of their culture. The characteristics of this millennial generation is they're very entrepreneurial. In other words, they could start stuff and they're great starters. Um, they're, they're technology savvy. They're also neo-traditional. What that means is that they're actually going back to the traditions of the bridge, believe it or not. Yeah, so, so their mindset is, uh, I'm gonna wait to get married, but I'm not gonna sleep around in the process. I'm gonna kinda just wait and then I'm gonna find the right one and I'm gonna do it. That was a pretty good characteristic of them. Uh, they're demanding. <laughs> and they want to be connected. They want to be connected. So today I want to speak to you, I used all that to kind of get your attention a little bit, um, about, about another uh, generation that's found in the Bible. Um, and, and before we get into the Joshua generation that I'm going to speak to you next week, um, I want to talk to you about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, uh, and, and basically I, I, I could do what I want. It's my sermon today, so <laughs> we'll talk about Joshua next week. But I felt in, in my heart that this is a good place to start today. Because, because, uh, because of the generation, how important generations are. Um, when you look at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right, we know that it's often quoted in the Bible, that he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this is what Israel and this is what the Jewish people were taught from centuries, uh, that those were the forefathers, those were the, those were the, those were the great men of faith, that they, that they, uh, that they applied those, those, those teachings and those learnings into, into, their, into their life. And when you think of Abraham, uh, Abraham was considered the altar generation. Stay with me now. The altar generation. In other words, Abraham started with nothing. Absolutely nothing. And everything that he ever received from God was through prayer. Someone say prayer. prayer. Everything he received from God was a result of God's promises to his life. So he, like the bridge generation here in the United States... They started with nothing. They were very frugal. Everything they have, they worked hard for it, and they got it, and they earned it, and they worked hard. Someone say amen. amen. Everything. Listen carefully now. Everything Abraham got, he got it through prayer. Amen. Isaac represents the inheritance generation. Stay with me now. In other words, they received everything they got by inheritance. So they necessarily didn't work for everything, but they sure didn't get everything handed to them either. But they also got a lot by inheritance. Someone say by inheritance. So it was given to him by his father Abraham. But he had to learn how to eventually dig his own wells. Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and now Jacob. Jacob represents the shortcut generation. They got everything they got in a different way. Jacob's name actually means schemer or deceiver. Jacob thought he could get the promise not by prayer, not by building an altar, not by digging wells, but by his intellect. Stay with me now. So the first generation represented by Abraham today, listen, here, here we go now, we're taking off, was the generation of prayer, okay? Was the generation of prayer. So, so, so anything in scripture, especially in the book of Acts, when you begin to read the Old Testament and Jesus goes to heaven, he promises the Holy Spirit, uh, Jesus tells them, go wait in that upper room because I'm about, something's about to happen. And, and, and when the disciples went to the upper room, they didn't have a planning meeting, a planning meeting. They did not have a matrix meeting. They did not have a strategizing meeting. What they did was they began to pray. Someone say pray. pray. Don't minimize what I'm telling you here today because prayer is the most powerful thing a man and a woman in a church could do. Someone say Amen. You are probably here because someone prayed for you. You are probably sitting in that men's home because someone prayed for you. You are probably sitting in that women's home because someone prayed for you. You're probably sitting in your seat today because someone prayed for you. Someone say prayer. A generation of prayer. The book of Acts was birthed because it was birthed in prayer. The Bible says that Abraham in his lifetime built seven altars. Stay with me now. Everywhere he went, he built an altar. You know what the altar represents? The altar represents prayer. <laughs> Altars represent four things. Number one, sacrifice. Someone say sacrifice. sacrifice. Come on, someone say sacrifice. sacrifice. 
He was going to sacrifice his promised son. We know the scriptures. Yeah, he was going to take Isaac up to the mountain, put him on the altar. Matter of fact, he had the knife, the dagger, ready to do it. And then God gave him a way out. Eventually, listen carefully now. Eventually, we have to get to the point in our walk with God where, it's, where, where, where it gets past what God could do for you. Sacrifice. I know when we first get saved, we come in with needs. We come in, we need to be healed, we need to be right, we need to be delivered, we need to get restored, we need to do all this stuff, and it's, it's, it's all about us at first. But then eventually in your walk with God, it's going to have to take a shift, where now God is saying, now where's your sacrifice? One day a week is not going to be good enough for the long haul. Our philosophy here in Victory Outreach Fremont is that Sundays aren't enough. That's why we'll be in church tonight. Calvary Chapel. Overflow campus life, getting educated, getting taught, getting groomed, getting set up, and sacrificing. Someone say sacrificing. You got to get beyond, come on somebody, a dollar for every ten dollars. My spiritual father, Pastor Steve Pineda, who pastored the church in Hayward for many years, was part of the pioneering generation. He would share stories with us week after week after week how they basically prayed everything in. I wonder if that generation is still alive today. Pray on it. I think I need to make a shirt. Pray on it. Pastor, I need to meet with you. Pray on it. Pastor, when are you available this week? Pray on it. Pastor, could I have a minute of your time? Pray on it. I think I'm going to get that. Hashtag pray on it. Tell your neighbor pray on it. Yeah, when's the last time you prayed on it? There was a generation of Victory Outreach called the Pioneering Generation that they would pray on everything. He would share stories of when they were uh, here and they didn't have money for food and they didn't have money for, 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 for anything. And one time his wife, Josie, came to him and asked him, uh, we have nothing for Esteban. Esteban was a little boy, two years old, maybe three years old. So we have nothing to eat. And, 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 and he told her, pray on it. Yeah. And I'm sure that conversation didn't end there. But what he did, according to him, is he said he went to the room. Went to the living room and he got on his knees and he began to pray to God. And he began to pray and said, God, you promised me. That if I would be obedient and come out here to the city of Hayward and, and, and give my life and sacrifice I have, sacrifice me, my wife, and my, and, my, and my young boy, if I came out here, you would provide for me. You would come through for me. That if I built this ministry, you would come through. And, and, and he said he was praying. He was praying. He got up. This is what he said. He said he got up and he felt like a cloud was in the living room. And he came out. And the minute he came out and looked at the, living, the cloud in the living room, the door knocked. And they opened up the door and there was four women there saying, hey, uh, something was placed on our heart earlier today to buy you and your family groceries. And so as he looked outside, there were four women bringing in groceries, bringing in groceries, bringing in, talking about praying it in. I'm talking about a generation that prayed everything in. Come on, somebody. Someone say sacrifice. This generation, the pioneering generation of Victory Outreach was often criticized, but they prayed a price and laid down the sacrifice at the altar. Come on, somebody. Come on. Pastor Ed and Sister Mitzi there in San Jose, the Duke of Earl. They were criticized for it. Yeah. Pastor Sonny even says, he says, I don't know what he was thinking. <laughs> you're going to tell me you're going to get these kids that are fresh off the streets, that are hardly saved. You're going to bring them up on the stage and dress them how they used to be dressed. Cholos and cholas and eyeliner and... And you're going to put together a play that's supposed to reach people like them? It'll never happen. Matter of fact, shut it down. But God, but God. And that play, that drama, that simple message began to pack out auditoriums, pack out schools, and began to win many souls. Someone say sacrifice. The altar not only represents sacrifice in Abraham's life, but it also represented a cleansing. Someone say cleansing. cleansing. He understood that by the standard of the Old Testament, that the shedding of the blood for his sins, then he would be forgiven. 
Another thing that the altar represented, obviously, was a place of prayer. It's critical that men and women completely understand the power of prayer. Someone say amen. amen. Everything the pioneering generation did in this ministry of Victory Outreach got done through prayer. The Bible says in Genesis 25, verse 5, that Abraham, after that, gave everything to Isaac. So in other words, other words, you have the praying generation, and then Isaac represents the inheritance generation. The problem with an inheritance is the person that receives it doesn't really fully appreciate the tremendous price that was paid for what they've been given. The doing without, the sacrificing to get where they are today. Let us, the Joshua generation, this church in Victory Outreach International, never take lightly what those that went before us paid a price for. Yes. Isaac had a lot going for him when you think about his life. He had a great father. He had a great upbringing. But eventually that was not good enough. Sooner or later he was going to have to have his own encounter. So just like some of us here today, isn't it great to be here? Yeah, it's great to see come alive in the river. It's great to see people jumping up at the altar. It's great to come into an environment and a winning atmosphere. It's great. But let me tell you this. Eventually, you're going to have to have your own encounter. Eventually, you're going to have to have your own relationship with Jesus. Isaac learned that he needed to eventually dig his own wells. But before he dug his own wells, he had to redig the wells of his father. Here's the application for you in this portion of the message. Let not the Joshua generational church, with, which is us, disrespect the old wells that the former generation left us. Come on, somebody. The pioneers of this ministry paid a heavy price. They paid a heavy price. I think this message is important for us here today because it puts things in perspective. It really lets us know that in our church, yeah, um, uh, uh, that there, there, are, there are generations that are represented here, yeah? And that we're being led by a Joshua generational leader. Come on, say amen. amen. And then there's Jacob. Ooh, Jesus. There's Jacob. Abraham, the praying generation. Uh, Isaac, the inheritance generation. And then there's Jacob. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, there's Jacob. Who could very well represent the third wave? Listen carefully. Jacob, Jacob, his name is, means deceiver. Uh, a heel grabber. Yeah, because when the mom was giving birth to him and his brother, Esau came out first, and the Scripture says that the little, the little baby hand was trying to hold his brother from coming out. Little, it means heel grabber. It means deceiver. It means schemer. Stay with me now. So in other words, Jacob, he represents the shortcut generation. It means they took shortcuts to get the blessings. Yeah. He thought he could get it by intellect. He said, I have a promise, but how do I get to my promise? I don't want to work for my promise. Tell me how I could scheme my way to the top. Tell me how I could, I could get there faster. You gotta be careful. Some of us need to take heed of that because, because, because age-wise, you may think you're certain, but we act like we got third wave, wave tendencies. And 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 Abraham was the praying generation. Jacob, or excuse me, Isaac was the inheritance generation. And then you got Jacob, who they were just trying to take shortcuts. See, he, he always intellectually tried to get things done with his intellect. Yeah, if you look at his life and you look at how he tried to get the blessings all the time, one of them was when he, well, he was cooking soup one day. Yeah, his brother Esau was a, was a hunter, and he had been hunting all day. His brother came in from working, and there he was, Jacob, with some nice frijoles. Nice bowl of beans, man. I'm almost done. With a nice bowl of beans. Oh, probably, 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 they were, they were probably refried. <laughs> if I had some cheese on them, sprinkle. 
pie, a little corn tortilla homemade on the side. Yeah, he had it. So when Esau came in, he's like, dude, what are you making? <laughs> he was like, you want some? And he said, yeah, I want, I, want, I want two. And he said, if you want this bowl of frijoles with tortillas with butter, <laughs> with a root beer, then you're going to have to give me your birthright. He took advantage of his brother that was tired and weak. Yeah. See, he was intellectually yeah. beating him. Yeah. See, he's trying to get the blessing by his intellect. He's trying to take a shortcut to the blessing. See that? See how that works? So you got a praying generation that prayed everything in. They didn't let the fact that their circumstances met, they didn't have, they didn't let their circumstances stop them from receiving. They said, if I don't have it, then I better get on my knees and pray for it. Then there was a generation that said, well, we inherited it. Yeah, it's been given to us, but we're still willing to work for it. Yeah, that's the Joshua generation. See, this church right here, we've been given a promise. What, to reach treasures out of darkness. Yeah, but it does not mean that we stop working for it. That means we got to roll up our sleeves like Isaac and dig some wells. We got to dig our own wells. Yeah, we got to dig our own wells and then redig the wells of the past as well. Yeah, so you got both things going on here. We honor the past. This church has a tremendous responsibility, my friend, as a Joshua generational church. Come on, somebody. Our job is to honor the past, is to honor the pioneers of this ministry, is to, is to, is to, is to not, not take what we've been taught and squander it, but to receive it and now pass it on to the next generation, to pass it on uncut. The uncut version of this vision has to be taught to all these kids you've seen on stage. So instead of judging them and instead of uh, 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 looking down at our noses at them and looking at them as though they have no potential and looking at them as like they have no future and looking at them as, well, they never did this and they don't know what I went through. And then, well, thank God they don't know what we went through. Thank God they don't ever have to put a pipe in their mouth, a needle in their arm, or a bottle to their lips. But they are just as important to this vision as the pioneers in the Joshua generation. So when you walk through this church, come on somebody, and you see them on their phones, don't judge them. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah they're always on your phone, always on your phone. Because their, their future depends on us. We need to be skilled too. Come on somebody. But Jacob, we got to make sure they don't act like Jacob. Trying to intellectually get their promise. No, we got to teach them how to pray too. We got to teach them how to get a hold of God too. We got to take them to the streets. Oh, well, they never show up. Well, yeah, well, go pick them up. Hunt them down. You know how to hunt it down. You know how to hunt stuff down that you were looking for before? You would walk for miles to get what you wanted with no shoes on. Right? What did the builder generation say? We walked through five miles of snow. We, said, we walked everywhere we went. Great. Thank you. Awesome. But I got an inheritance now. But I will not squander my inheritance. I won't be like Esau. And just give it up in a time of weariness. And give it up in a time where I'm tired. And give it up in a time of weakness. I fought too hard for this inheritance. Yes, it was given to me, but I'll be darned. If I'm going to give it up and sell it for a bowl of beans. With cheese on top. <laughs> Jacob not only tried to swindle his brother, but he also swindled his dad. The Bible says he put some hairy stuff on his arm because his brother Esau was hairy. Big old hairy red guy. And he walked up to his dad. He walked up to his dad, Isaac. Isaac could barely see. Isaac couldn't see. He was going blind. And he was wanting to bless his sons before he died. And Esau, uh, excuse me, Jacob, Jacob got there first. And his mom told him, told him put some. His mom, see, moms, you got to watch out too. Yeah. You're teaching your kids to do wrong. Anyway, 
Go ahead, mijo. Go, go. Oh, he was homesick. You don't even know where he's at. Anyway. I'm almost done. As a matter of fact, Paloma, come up here to prove that I'm almost done. So not only did he get the birthright trickily, trick, trickily? Sneaky. But he, he got his dad, too. His dad was blind. His dad was getting ready to die. And the Bible says Jacob put hairy things on his arm to act like he was his brother. Yeah. And what did his dad say? Here's a heavy point. What did his dad say? His dad says, you, you, feel, you feel like Esau, but you sound like Jacob. He goes, oh, no, Dad, it's me. It's Esau. See, that's why you got to be careful of what you feel. That your feelings... Don't override what you hear. See, there's too many Christians in God's house today that you you always by feeling. Oh, I feel. I'm not feel. I feel. See, that's that postmodernism mindset sometimes. Where, well, oh, I, I don't feel. I don't. Oh no. Oh no. I'm not feeling it today. You send mixed messages. You can't build a church with feely people. You got to go by what you hear. What are you hearing? What are you hearing? In this message, I wonder what you're really hearing. And he said, you feel like Esau, but you sound like Jacob. And he said, but anyway, and Jacob prayed for him and gave him the, the inheritance. Yeah, so he got his brother, got his dad, and then eventually Esau got mad and said, I'm gonna kill you. So it caused Jacob to take off on the run. And he took off to his uncle's house. There's his mom again. Just go over, to, go over to my brother's house. See, moms. Go over to your brother's house. Nobody will know you're there. I already called your uncle. Your Theo knows you're coming. No, go to the home. That's where you should have went. Should have went to the home. There you go, mom. Go to your uncle's. I already called him. He knows you're coming. So he goes over there, he runs into Uncle Laban's house. Jacob goes to Uncle Laban's and then falls in love with the girl over there. And what did Laban do? Laban burned his nephew. Laban said, work for me for seven years and I'll give you her. After seven years, he lied to him and gave him the one with the crooked eye. How many thank God for the crooked eye? And he woke up one day and he goes, oh my God, you promised me Rachel, but you gave me Leah. And he goes, oh my God, I'm sorry. He goes, work seven more years and I'll give you the good, I'll give you the one with the, with the right. I know it's funny. Hey, I'm not making this up. This is not a reality show, but this is Bible. It's funny though, right? Yeah. You, you ought to read your Bible sometime. You'd be, be, no, be amazed. So what happens to Jacob? Jacob only reaps what he sows. He's been sowing all this, all this, all this, all this fake, deceiving, scheming stuff, and finally it caught up to him. Yeah. But I love this part. Jacob leaves his uncle's house. His uncle says, basically, just get out of here, dude. Just here, what do I need to give you? To, you're messing me up. Let me just give you this and give you that and give you, take all the girls and get out of here. Yeah, and there goes Jacob. Felt like he was winning. I'm winning, I just won. Ha ha, got over. Hey, hey. Still got my promise. And he gets to a place, the Bible says he goes to Jacob. Jacob. I actually almost like his name. J, I wrote it down here. J A B O K. Jabak. He goes to Jabak. Jabak in the Hebrew means a place of breaking. So there he is, still scheming, but then God takes him to a place where he's about to break him. See, this next generation, this third wave, this Isaac generation, this, this next now generation, you need to be broken. Kids that are up here in stage, high school, junior high, college, you need to have your, your time where God breaks you. The Bible says he went in there and he started looking around at all his stuff and he goes, man, I sure do got it going on. I got, I got, I got wives, children, I got chariots, I got camels, I 
I got spinners on my chariot. I got, I got robes. I got sandals. I got Nikes. I got Jordans. I got all this stuff. And I got it going on. Whoa. He goes, but I'm missing something. Something's missing in my life. And then the Bible says that heaven unleashed an angel to him. The Bible says they started wrestling that night. And Jacob started to realize that he wasn't in control anymore. He says, my dad prayed everything in. Or my grandpa prayed everything in. My dad Isaac received the inheritance. I squandered that. And God said, God sent him an angel where he began to wrestle with Jacob. You know the story all night. Jacob got to a place where he says, he says, I'm not going to let you go or don't let me go. And he's wrestling with God all night. And the Bible says eventually after that, the angel dislocated his hip. And Jacob no longer walked with, with arrogance. And he no longer walked with pride. And he no longer walked, walked with intellect. And he no longer was scheming and deceiving and heal grabbing and he wasn't no longer living life on his terms but he got to the point in his life where God had to break him and until you get to that place where God has to break you my friend you know what it reminds me of when someone can't walk like that you don't think you got to grab onto everything they become real vulnerable the Bible says for the rest of his life he walked having to depend see that having to depend some of us you haven't been been through that process yet in your walk with God where you've had to depend you've had to depend on others no, just flow sister flow you haven't, you haven't been to that place yet and until you get there Jacob got there that's that's heavy too close with this the breaking is when the blessing came sometimes you got to hold on to God longer than your flesh wants to if you're going to get the answer from the throne of heaven praying generation an inheritance generation and a, and a, a deceiving generation that eventually Jacob got it together what did the Lord say? Your, Lord, your name is no longer Jacob. But now I'm changing your name. And your name is now Israel. It's heavy. So I got the message out. I didn't give it all to the first service. But I got it out. I said what I had to say. Generations. Next week we're going to talk about jo uh, Joshua and his character, the way he led. It's going to make sense to you. I hope today you were able to say, man, I can. I appreciate that. I appreciate those that went before me, those that paid a price so that I could sit here today and receive my inheritance. Yeah? But if we don't make some changes in our life, like Jacob made, then we're not going to receive anything. And so today, let's go ahead and play a song. I think I'm done. I went a little longer than I wanted to. How long did I go? Don't even matter. It don't even matter 10.30. I'll keep you here to 1.30 if I want to. But I want you to stand. I want you to stand. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to close your eyes. Here I am. Where you're at. Ready and willing. Just for a few moments. Here I am. Use me to 